the message we must understand some important words that are mentioned in this verse the kingdom of god the gospel repent and believe if we understand these four different words we would be able to understand the message of the lord first the kingdom of god we would look at it uh, from three dimensions basically it implies the entire sphere of god's rule or god's control the old testament declared that god exercised sovereign control over all i would uh, read a couple of verses for you psalm 103 verse 19 it says the lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all again in first chronicles chapter 29 and verses 11 and 12 we read like this yours o lord is the greatness the power and the glory the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours yours is the kingdom o lord and you are exalted as head above or over all both riches and honor come from you and you reign over all in your hand is power and might in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all now often this was not and even today it is not acknowledged by all that the kingdom belongs to him god exercises his sovereign control full control over all though it is not acknowledged by all the fact remains in the book of daniel we read about a person who first wound acknowledge the sovereign kingship of god king nebuchadnezzar at one time he wouldn't acknowledge you read about that in daniel chapter 4 and verse 30 daniel chapter 4 and verse 30 the king spoke saying is not this great babylon that i have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty there is no place for god i have built by my power for the honor of my majesty but god intervened in his life and he went through a very bitter experience and after that he acknowledged that you read in verses 34 and 35 of the same chapter at the end of the time i nebuchadnezzar lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and i blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth no one can restrain his hand or say to him what have you done now that's one dimension of the kingdom of god the kingdom of god rules over all he ru- reigns over all as i said though not acknowledged by all people the second dimension in the old testament 
uh, we uh, read about uh, a future kingdom, a visible form of government under Messiah, the king, wherein God's sovereign authority will be acknowledged by all. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, we read about this future kingdom. In the days of these kings, if you read the preceding verses, God, through a dream given to King Nebuchadnezzar, talked about the different world kingdoms that would arise and fall, starting with the Babylonian kingdom, then the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Grecian kingdom, the Roman kingdom. And at the end of it, he talks about something happening, a stone cut out without hands coming and uh, uh, destroying that whole image and everything falls flat and then comes a kingdom. So he says here, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand for ever. Also in Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. Here Daniel, he saw a vision. In that vision, now he is mentioning, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and this kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Now though, Israel longed for this kingdom. They had hoped that this kingdom would come and overthrow the Roman rule. In Jesus' day, during his first advent or first coming itself. But it was not to happen. It didn't happen. The penitent criminal on the cross saw it to be futuristic when he said to Jesus in Luke 23 42 Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom or when you come in your kingly power the disciples too recognized that prior to his ascension from earth after his death and resurrection, but before his ascension, they realized that this kingdom had not come yet. That's why they asked in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus told them not to worry about that in verse 7. And Jesus wanted them to focus on the mission the Lord had for them at that point of time. That's what you read in Acts 1 verse 8. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria and uh, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. He said, you focus on that. This is the immediate plan and purpose for you, my followers, about the kingdom that we are talking about. This is not the time. The Father has kept all things uh, under His control. He knows it and it will be revealed at the right time. Now quickly moving on to the third dimension of the kingdom of God. The ter third dimension of the kingdom of God. Now this kingdom 
the Bible says, was ushered in and preached by Jesus Christ when he was upon this earth. And the Bible says, the people were pressing into this kingdom. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 16, you read about that. Now this kingdom, the third dimension, the present kingdom is unlike an earthly kingdom with geographical boundaries. It's not a political or a military kingdom. It did not come, as you read in Luke 17 and verse 20, it did not come with outward show or observable signs. Since the king was present amidst them, he could say, the kingdom of God is among you, or in the midst of you, or within your grasp. That's what we read in Luke 17 and verse 21. During his ministry, he reasoned out to them that the kingdom had evidently arrived. Matthew 12, 28, I'll read that verse. Matthew 12, verse 28. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Evidently, he says, the kingdom of God has come upon you because there was the demonstration of the king's power and authority over both natural and supernatural powers. This kingdom has to do with more than the physical and the material. It has to do rather with the moral and the spiritual. In Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, we read like this, Romans 14 and verse 17, The kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So this is a different kind of a kingdom. This is what God is doing right now in our times in people's hearts and lives through His Spirit. Mere flesh born, physically born, are not part of this kingdom. Only the spirit born, spiritually born, can be admitted into this kingdom. In John chapter 3, the Lord made that very clear. John chapter 3 verses 3, 6 and 7 I would read. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. You must be born again or born of the Spirit if you have to have anything to do with this kingdom that the Lord is talking about. In Colossians 1 and verse 13, Colossians 1 verse 13, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now this kingdom is a present reality. There are people who by the working of the Spirit of God get delivered from the power of darkness, from the kingdom of darkness and they are being translated into the kingdom of God's Son. Now the expression kingdom of God occurs mostly in the Gospels according to Matthew, 
Mark and Luke whereas in John's gospel and the epistles phrases such as eternal life salvation etc referring to the very same reality occur now the next word is the gospel having said so much about the kingdom i uh, we would now look at the word gospel the gos word gospel as most of us we know it simply means uh, uh, good news uh, good tidings the new testament talks about the gospel of god the gospel of the kingdom of god the gospel of the grace of god the gospel of jesus christ the gospel of peace the gospel of our salvation the glorious gospel the everlasting gospel etc the gospel has to do with god taking control through the mission of his son the messiah his suffering his death and resurrection setting us free from slavery to sin preaching the gospel demands prompt response preaching the gospel demands prompt response it is mentioned there the two uh, things are mentioned that we need to respond that way only repent and believe these are the two things repent and believe the gospel for the kingdom of god has come the kingdom of god has arrived now repent and believe the gospel the gospel is both an affectionate invitation and also an authoritative command it is an invitation very affectionate invitation but we must also realize that it is an authoritative command response to this is not optional but mandatory and obligatory so let's now closely look at these two words familiar words let's remind ourselves again the importance of these two words repent and believe a children's hymn best defines repentance repentance is to leave the sins we loved before and show that in earnest grief by doing so no more i'll say that again repentance is to leave the sins we loved before and show that we in earnest grief by doing so no more <clears throat> repentance is to lament that we are in sin we need to be saved and then repentance is also to mourn that this need has put christ to shameful suffering and death and then thirdly repentance is to abhor our life of sin again i'll read these three important things repentance is to lament that we are in sin and we need to be saved and then repentance is also to mourn that this need has put christ to shameful suffering and death and then repentance is to abhor hate our life of sin john's baptism was meant to be only a symbol of repentance but he demanded fruits proof of it saying produce fruit that is consistent with repentance that's what he said in matthew 3:8 produce a fruit that is consistent with repentance now the fourth word is believe in repentance we should not see a sin too great we need to see you know the sinfulness of sin we must you know be concerned about uh, Uh, the seriousness of sin in our lives but then someone said you should not allow 
you know uh, uh, such a thing to happen that you see the greatness of sin so much that you can't even believe that Christ can pardon don't see your sin too great for even Christ to pardon trust him to save you that, i mean after you have repented after you have genuinely repented trust him to say you after all in romans 4:25 it is said he was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification believing the gospel but is more than accepting the fact of christ sacrifice as true believing in the biblical sense is more than merely accepting the fact of the gospel giving mental assent to the fact of the gospel believing biblically is commitment rolling our burdens on to the lord and entrusting ourselves totally to him now before closing now these two words again i would like to uh, consider for a few moments repent and uh, believe or repentance and faith must go together both are two sides of the same coin someone said one turn away from sin and the other turn toward god someone said god has joined these two together repentance and faith together and let no man put that asunder god has joined these two together let not man put asunder these two are uh, twins almost born together these two repentance and faith are twins like twins almost born together though sometimes one might proceed and lead to the other the one who had offended the king must repent and believe in his counsel after all he is willing to forgive and accept this twin command applies not only to a younger young beginner but even to the old grey headed christians because many times we think this repentance and faith you know we do once for all once at the beginning of our christian life but that is not right repentance and faith are not a passing phase we have done it and we have passed from that phase now we have moved on in our christian life no these are not a passing phase but a continuing attitude sinning repenting and believing will keep with us till we live as long as we live there would be need for both repentance and also believing may the lord help us if we have never even once repented and turned to the lord in faith let's not delay any further the kingdom of god has arrived the kingdom of god is at hand repent and believe the gospel and those of us who repented 10 years ago 20 years ago 50 years ago but do not live any more in a spirit of repentance in a spirit of constant faith in the lord jesus christ we need to think afresh and decide that we would never graduate from move from this need to repent and need to believe because these are attitudes 
the Lord expects of us to exercise, to practice to the very end of our lives. Each person, however spiritual you are, however grown you are in Christ, you and I would need to repent and believe again and again and again to the end of our lives. May God bless us.